If you're not tethering in your food photography workflow, then I'm gonna be honest, you are missing out big time. Tethering is one of the things that totally changed the game for me in my work. And once I got over all the hesitations I had, like it's too complicated, you need so much equipment, only the pros tether and actually tried it, all I could think about was why didn't I do this like 500 years ago. In today's video, we're gonna talk all about how you can get easily started with tethering. Tether shooting is basically where you link your camera up to your computer via a cable so you get a large preview of what your camera is seeing and the ability to adjust your camera settings directly from your computer or smartphone or tablet. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, why would I need that? My camera has a live view LCD screen. And let me tell you, this has been revolutionary for me. Yes, the screen on my camera is helpful in certain situations, but there are a lot of situations where that screen is just too small, or I'm shooting a big overhead scene where my camera is attached to a tripod way over my head, and constantly trying to check on what's going on is just super inconvenient. Tethering also simplifies my workflow so much, completely removing a couple of steps, which allows me to go from shoot to editing and processing my images much, much quicker. When you shoot tethered, those image files go straight onto a hard drive on your computer, rather than the little SD card in your camera. So at the end of the shoot, I'm already ready to go with my files and I don't need to spend that extra time transferring the images and formatting my card. And it's also just that little bit more security that my files are already in a place where I can back them up straight away. And it's one less opportunity to lose them in this whole process. Okay, so before we jump in, in order to get set up tethered shooting, here is what you're gonna need. Your camera, a tethering cable, a laptop, computer, iPad or phone, some kind of device, an external hard drive and some tethering software. The kind of cable you need is going to depend totally on your camera brand and laptop connection. Tether tools have the best tool out there where you can plug in the exact brand and make of your camera and your laptop and it's gonna tell you exactly which cable you need so you don't need to worry about not having the right connection. And it's also gonna show you which tethering softwares are compatible with your brand. Brand. For me, with my Sony A7R 3 and my MacBook Pro, it's a really simple USB-C to USB-C connection, but your combination could be different, so do hop on to that link in the description to check it out. So one of the things that you wanna make sure when you're buying a tethering cable is to make sure you get one long enough. It kind of defeats the whole point of tethering. If you order a cable that's too short and it doesn't even reach from your camera to your laptop, so I would say you want at least three meters for a tethering cable, but preferably five meters, especially if you're shooting overhead shots and you wanna have your laptop in a different part of the studio so things don't get too cluttered. You don't want any tension on your cable and ideally you want a lot of slack so that there's plenty of room on the floor, no risk of tripping over things and pulling things over. Okay, on to software. Most of the mainstream brands have their own dedicated tethering software, which is free like Canon EOS Utility, Sony Imaging Edge, etc. And you can also tether directly into Lightroom with some cameras, or there's the most comprehensive software around, which is Capture One. Over the years, I've tried a few. I shot with Canon EOS Utility while I was a Canon shooter, then Sony Imaging Edge for many years when I switched over, and now I use Capture One Pro. I do find Capture One is the most comprehensive software in terms of features, and if you shoot professionally and work with clients regularly like I do, then I would definitely recommend making the switch. But if you're mostly a hobby photographer or you're just starting out with a small business, one of the brand specific softwares will be absolutely fine. I don't personally love shooting tethered directly into Lightroom, and especially as a Sony shooter, it doesn't even connect directly. There are a couple of workarounds I could do, but it's just a bit too much hassle for me when I really like the workflow that I have in Capture One. So before we jump into a quick shoot, let's just have a quick chat about the four reasons why you should be shooting tethered in your food photography if you're not already. When it comes to composition, I'm 100% for planning before you start. You guys know this from my previous videos all about composition planning. Planning and sketching out your compositions allows you to effectively use compositional techniques to give your food photography direction and focus. So when you put so much time and effort into planning your photo before you start your shoot, 
tethered shooting will give you the best chance of achieving the vision you have in your mind. You'll be able to slow down, really look at your composition in real time, evaluate your work as you go and make adjustments earlier, which generally result in better outcomes and better out of camera images. One of the biggest disappointments after a food shoot is to upload your photos onto your computer and realize that they are all just a little bit out of focus. This is one of the things that I really struggled with when I was relying on the tiny LCD screen on the back of my camera and tethering pretty much eliminated this problem. When you tether, you're gonna be able to zoom in on exactly the point of your photo you choose as your focal point with a huge preview on your screen and adjust your focus perfectly. I personally use manual focus most of the time, especially because I shoot on a tripod and I just like the control that I get with it. When you walk into your shoot with a clear vision for what you want to achieve through planning and you shoot tethered, you're already seeing on screen the images you're coming out with. So there's no reason to rely on quantity to get the shot. Because of the ability to really slow down and nail your composition, set your focus, and make adjustments, you probably won't need to take 50 shots and then spend time picking out the best one. And that leads me nicely onto the next point. This is probably the biggest one. The extra two minutes you spend setting up your tethering cable and camera is without a doubt going to save you time during and after your shoot. As well as having a much larger preview of your image, you also have the ability to preview your histogram right on the screen and even make some immediate adjustments to your raw files. These adjustments will allow you to see if any further on-set changes are actually necessary or whether you have enough detail in the highlights and shadows to work with. So let's jump into a super quick shoot so I can show you how I use tethering in my food photography. Okay, welcome to the studio. We are gonna go through a quick tethered shoot together. I'm gonna give you an overview on my tethering setup in Capture One. I'm not gonna be going through every single part of what I do in Capture One in detail. That's a whole other video in itself. But yeah, this should give you a good idea of how it works. So we're gonna go ahead and shoot this green kind of gin and tonic. So we're going for a very dark and moody green vibe. So on my laptop, well, normally my laptop, We've got the iMac today, so hopefully you can see it a bit better. What I like to do is when I open up Capture One, you're gonna to go to File, New Session. So what that's gonna do is come up with this little window here. And here you can put in the name of your session and choose the location of where you want that session catalog and your session folders to be. So you can go ahead and browse to wherever you want it to be. I've already created this one. And then what Capture One is gonna do is it's gonna create you four folders. Your Capture Folder selects Output and Trash. So your Capture Folder is where all images go straight away as soon as you hit the shutter button. It's essentially like a holding folder for every image you take during the shoot. Then what what is one of my favorite features of Capture One is the shoot organization is once you're done or even as you go, depending on how you like to work, you can go through those images and choose to either move them to your selects folder or to your session trash. This already cuts down the editing time in your images so much because you can just straight away in the program be like, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And we'll do a little bit of that at the end of this shoot. And then the output folder is where Capture One would put any final processed images if you're processing them in Capture One. Personally, I'm still processing in Lightroom at the moment but I'll still import to Lightroom from the selects folder and then choose that output folder as my export folder. So that's how I like to set up a shoot. And then let's get into the setup a little bit. So here on the left, you can see we've got my live view. So this is what my camera is seeing right now. You'll see as I put my hand in front, this is a live view screen. So over here, in the camera tab, I can control every setting to do with my camera. So I'm shooting with flash today. So I've got my shutter speed set to 1 250th, which is the maximum shutter speed of a Sony with the flash that I'm using. If I just turn off the trigger for a second, you will be able to see this is what my camera is actually seeing right now. So I've used my shutter speed to cut out all of this ambient light in the room. So when I take the shot, the light coming from my strip softbox is the only thing that's gonna hit the frame. So let's go ahead and turn that back on. There we go. So this just helps me be able to see what I'm doing. And then Capture One down the sidebar has an absolute plethora of tools that you can use. If you just right click 
and say add tool, you'll see there is this huge, huge list of things. And a lot of them are grayed out because they are specifically to do with processing and this is a tethering live capture window. But depending on the brand of camera you have, you'll have all sorts of options here. So the ones that I like to have in my panel are the camera, which is literally just the panel that allows me to control the camera. The camera focus can be useful if you're using auto focus. The camera settings, this is just a little bit of a more detailed breakdown of your settings where you can change, for example, your file type your aspect ratio, the drive mode. So if I wanted to change to continuous shooting, I can do that all from within here. And the last one that I like to have is the overlay. Now this is probably one of the reasons that I love shooting in Capture One so much. So what this allows you to do is to upload a PNG file of, well, actually anything into Capture One so that you can see it on your image as you're shooting. So I've created an entire set of composition grids. We've got the rule of thirds, the golden ratio, the golden triangle, dynamic symmetry, and the golden spiral in all different orientations. And you can just upload these right into Capture One and use them to help guide your composition as you're shooting. These are all available as a download inside Food Photography Academy. So if you're a member, just search for Capture One overlays and you'll find them. With that being said, let's jump into some actual shooting. So I'm gonna turn the grid on at the moment and kind of talk you through the logic of this composition. So I've already gone ahead and set the basic structure. So what you'll see is I've used this intersection here to place this main glass, and this is gonna be the hero subject. And then what I've done is actually used the other lines. So we've got this line just touching this glass. We've got this glass really focused on these two, and we've got this one just brushing this one. But what I've also done is kind of use the overall diagonals. So this main diagonal line, we've got the bowl, the main glass, and this glass all following that line. And then we've got this glass and this glass kind of following this intersectional line. And it's just a really nice way to help you balance the frame and kind of, you know, decide where you want things to go, particularly if you're working with a lot of small subjects. So overall, I'm happy with the main composition. So now we kind of get to do the fun part, which is styling. So this image, I really want it to have a predominantly green feel. I'm going for a monochromatic look with a dark and moody light. I've already got some cucumbers here. I've got some basil, I've got some lime peels, and I also have some peppercorns. Where did I put those? This is why I like to have one place where I put everything because I lose things. Did I even bring them in? I, th I swear I did. I see them. We are good to go. What I'm gonna start with is putting a few bits of cucumber inside the glass. So I'm gonna do all of this before I add the ice because I do generally find once you've got the ice in, you really wanna be ready to go. And I don't love using fake ice. I do have some fake ice, but generally I only really wanna use it for staging. I don't love using fake ice in actual shots. And I don't yet have any of that super fancy like really, really nice acrylic ice. Let me actually grab the other one as well. Sometimes it can feel like you're doing surgery, <laughs> but often when I'm doing this, it, it reminds me really why I'm not a surgeon. So what I'm trying to do is kind of stick these to the glass. With everything I'm doing, I'm constantly checking on the screen. So rather than having to go back and forth to my camera, I can just turn, look at the screen and know if I like what I'm doing or if I want to change something. So I'm just going to keep going with this. Another piece here. Yep. And then let's do a couple on some other glasses. So it's a little easier the higher up the glass I get. And these are going to move around once the liquid's in, but they will stay sort of in a bit of a pattern. There we go. And actually these two glasses, these are all the same. They're from the same range, but these two are green. And it's quite subtle in the image, but I think it does add a nice amount of variation. So when I was sort of choosing props, when I'm choosing props generally, it's always good to think about what does this particular prop add to this shoot? You know, is it is it adding a color or a texture or a pattern or something? So glassware is always a fun one. There's so many different options out there of fun glasses. Yep, and then let's do a couple on this one and then we've got some left to do a little garnish. Now this one is only coming in from this side so I'm really gonna focus on the right hand side. There we go. 
So let's just double check the position of the glasses. Still looks good. Yeah, I'm still happy with this line up here and this line down here. So let's move on to some lime wedges. I've also got a couple of lime spirals in there, but let's make a few little lime wedges because that's what I think we're gonna use to fill up these bowls. So I've got my little sharp knife here, nice shine on it. And then I'm going to slice it like this. Now something that I always try and think about is these diagonals as well, because we've still got this diagonal coming up here, which with these line wedges, it's a good opportunity to add that little bit of direction because every little thing in your frame is gonna sort of guide the eye to certain places. So I do wanna have one that sort of follows that diagonal, but it doesn't necessarily need to sit quite on the top like that. Give us a couple of smaller wedges. So we have a little bit more control in the bottom and just help us create a few more layers. Yes, that looks nice. Now I feel like it's following that line, but not perfectly. And I think we just need to fill in that back bit with a couple of little wedges. After I've taken my test shot of my props, I haven't actually taken another shot yet. And I'm gonna take one in just a second. But I do tend to spend quite a lot of time setting things up before I hit the shutter again, because I do want to make sure that everything is sort of making sense and just take take time about it. There's no sort of massive need to rush. It might be nice to see a bit of the peel on that one. Yes. All right, so let's take a test shot and see where things are at. So I'm just going to hit the release. And then the test shot is gonna come up on this window on the right. So let's have a look. So far, I am really enjoying the vibe of this image. We can also over here just turn the overlay off. I really like the arrangement of these limes now. I'm quite happy with that. So I think let's go ahead and add a few little bits of basil and the peppercorns in the scene because that will be sort of a nice dressing before we get to kind of bringing in the ice and bringing in the drinks. I've got this really nice little basil plant. I do really enjoy getting the plants rather than the packets because I just think the leaves are always a nicer quality. So I'm going to go to the bottom because I want to look for some smaller leaves and I'm just going to pick a few sort of nice ones, placing them around the scene. I think we'll take these couple of couple of medium ones. I love basil, it's so, it smells amazing and it's so pretty. I don't wanna to touch them too much with my hands. Once I've cut them, I do try if possible to use the tweezers as much as possible just to avoid any heat from my hands, kind of wil wilting them quickly. They do last a lot longer if you don't touch them too much. Let's put the grid back on because that might give us a couple of points. Like we've got this little intersection here, which could be a really nice place to have something. So let's, it's flipped over. Leaves don't always behave themselves very well. And then let's just kind of, sort of let them fall. I think that one might be a bit too big. Okay, let's take a shot and see how that looks. Because I want it to look natural, but as you can see these things, they're not really that natural. Okay, that is nice, but these two, as you can see, are not really in the light very well. So I am just gonna move them forward a little bit, just to see, and I'm gonna flip one upside down as well, because they catch the light very differently when they're upside down. Let's see how that looks instead. Yeah, it's better. I definitely think we need another one here, or we need something. Maybe this one could actually come forwards a little bit as well. No, preferred it back here. Because we've got a nice amount of light on that plate in that corner. Let's go with that for now. And then let's bring in some peppercorns. So peppercorns are another really nice sort of complement to a gin and tonic. And I think they're gonna kind of complement the dark and moody feel. We're gonna put a few in the drink as well. I can totally see that's gonna go flying. There's gonna be peppercorns everywhere. Oh, there's already peppercorns everywhere. Let's do a couple here. I don't wanna overdo it because I don't want it to look messy and not styled. Take a few off. Yeah. So next I wanna do garnishes and that is the last thing that I wanna do before we bring 
the icing. Although I realised that I didn't put the basil in this bowl yet. I meant to put a few of these basil leaves in here. Okay, let's just check that. Look, that, that is looking good. Yeah. I like it. Now let's do some garnishes. So I'm just going to decide, because I've got these cocktail sticks here and I have them in gold and in silver and I'm not quite sure which one is going to look better. So I'm just going to hold them up and take a shot. And the gold one. What looks better? So we've got silver gives a really cool feel. Gold is slightly warmer and reflects the green a bit more. So I think we're going to go for gold. So what I'm going to do is take a couple of the leftover cucumber slices that I made and fold them in and sort of alternate how I'm pushing them on and then push them up. And I'm going to do sort of two or three on each cocktail stick just to give a little bit of a ribbon effect like so and then give it a good sort of press here the heat from your hands can actually help to kind of keep it in place so i'm just going to go and leave that there i think i'll do another two in case we want to put it i probably won't put one in all three this does work best with slices that aren't too thick so i like to use a vegetable peeler to slice the cucumbers and i think that gives really nice ribbons. Okay, let's do one more. Okay, I think it's time to grab some ice. So I'm gonna go get some ice, fill up the glasses, and then we'll do our final styling and shooting. Okay, so I've got my bowl of ice. So let's go ahead and fill up the glasses, then we're gonna set the focus. So I'm gonna pick sort of the nicest looking ones for this front glass. Can kind of sort of melt them a little bit in my hands first, just to get rid of that frostiness. Okay, that looks good. And then I'm gonna keep a couple for sort of at the front of the scene as well, because we might wanna put some around the scene afterwards. Okay, let's put this over here. I'm just gonna go ahead and for now, set my focus on that front glass on the cucumber. I am gonna put this on the garnish and again, this is one of the things I love about tethering is you can see on my screen how much bigger that preview is. So I'm not even looking at the LCD on my camera because it is just not anywhere near as clear. So let's go ahead and take another shot, see how the ice is looking. Okay, nice. So I'm gonna go ahead and add the gin to the front one and the back one. I'm not gonna add the gin to the two sides because to be honest, it, it doesn't look that different. It, when you're shooting drinks, alcohol does behave differently than water. So you can't really just replace it, say with fizzy water. But if you've got drinks that are kind of cropped off to the side or they're, they're out of focus in the background because they're outside of the depth of field, you really aren't gonna know. So then I sort of don't really see the point of adding the alcohol to those ones. So I'm just gonna do this one and this one. So a nice way to use up those like little bottles you have lying around. This should be a two shot measure. So I'm just gonna go ahead and pour that straight in. I'm gonna go ahead and put the garnishes on before I pour the tonic water because when I pour the water, I wanna take the shots quite quickly after that because that initial kind of fizzy bubbliness that you get, that can disappear quite quickly and I really wanna capture that. So I may also end up compositing these images together sort of as I pour each one because it may just be that I get a good look from one. So for these garnishes, I am going to also use the lines of the dynamic symmetry grid to help me position these. So for this one, for the main one, I think I want to have it sort of following that line. So I'm going to go ahead and balance it on that ice there. And that should stay put for quite a while. Okay, let's do the back. Let's have this one going in the opposite direction because we want to create a little bit of that dynamic tension as well. But that does look a little bit far up to me. So let's see if we can push that in a little bit more and just hook that last piece of cucumber. That's better, that's way better. Okay, and let's put the last one, say on this back one, 
kind of out the back. So now we've got, kind of got the garnishes following this line down here, this line over here, and this line down here. Let's use this garnish as our main focus point so we can set that right now so that we are completely ready to go as soon as that tonic goes in. So let's just go ahead and move the focus point here and get that really crisp. I've gone for an aperture of 6.3, which is quite deep for this kind of angle. So it's not creating too much of a blurry background. So I know that focus is gonna be nice. Okay, there we go. Right, so let's grab some tonic and then we're gonna shoot each image as we go along. So I'm gonna start with the main hero. And I'm gonna fill it here and then straight away I'm going to take a few shots. So as you can see over here, if we come over, let me just turn the grid off so you can see a bit better. If we zoom in on that image, you can really capture that nice fizziness, but that won't last for too long. So let's go ahead and do the other ones. Do this one. And the last one. Oh, I think we might need a little bit more in that one. Okay. Very nice. Now I'm just gonna add those couple of peppercorns in the top, like we talked about earlier. And I can also kind of composite these in without, you know, it affecting that fizziness. So let's just go ahead and drop a few in each one. Because we want all of the garnishes that we've used on the scene to make sense. You don't wanna be putting a garnish on the, on the table that's not actually in the food. Take one more. There we go, nice. I think I'm gonna call that it for this shot. I don't think I'm gonna add any ice on the scene. It already looks quite busy and I'm quite happy with it. Let's jump into how I go through and choose my selects and trash my images in terms of organization to speed up the next part of my process. So if we just maximize this window. So here we are in the session catalog. So down the side, we've got all of the images that we took during the shoot. I know from here, all the way down to where we started putting in tonic. These were all just tests. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and hold down shift and select all of those images and right click and move to session trash. So that's gonna go through and just redistribute those images. So if we come back to our little folder section over here, we'll see in our trash folder, we now have all these test images, which we know we're not gonna go ahead and process. So if we go back to our capture folder, now we can start going through our final images and picking some selects. I'm not gonna go through every single one and make you sit here and watch me do a whole selection, but I do really like this one. I think it's got a lot of texture. So what I'm gonna do is again, right click and move to selects folder going to move it to a new location and now we can see in the selects folder we have our selected image so oh that's a little bit close just wanted to check that focus so this is just a really handy way of going through quickly after your shoot picking your selects trashing images you don't want and then with that selects folder you can either carry on processing them in capture one or you can do what i do and just import that folder into lightroom and then finish your images. So there we go. That is the way that I use Capture One and I love tethering. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you wanna see more videos about food photography and I will see you next time.